Good evening, everyone. I see you can't see me, but I can see you. I'm not sure what's going on with my computer, but I am Garbo Hearn. I'm the director of Pyramid Art Books and Custom Framing located in the heart of the Dunbar community in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we are excited to have Dr. Miguel De, De La Tour. I don't, I'm gonna roll those R's, I'm gonna try it, and Reverend Griffin here to discuss decolonizing Christianity, becoming badass believers. Uh, thank you, Anna, for getting us started. And I want to introduce our moderator, Reverend Wendell Griffin, my pastor of the New Millennium Church, a circuit judge, and just an all around good person. And he's, he's, everything he does is described in the title, uh, title of this book, need I say more, but welcome Dr. De La Torre and Reverend Griffin. Take it away. Thank you very much, Garbo Hearn. Thank you, Honor Hearn, and welcome everyone to this book talk with Dr. Miguel De La Torre. Uh, Dr. De La, Miguel De La Torre is professor of social ethics and Latinx studies at Ely School of Theology in Denver, Colorado, and is a prolific contemporary Latinx religious scholar. I became acquainted with his work years ago when he was a regular contributor to Ethics Daily. He was born in Cuba a month before the Castro Revolution, came to the United States with his family as a refugee when he was six months old, started a real estate company in Miami when he was 19, became active in local politics, once ran for seat in the Florida House of Representatives. He and I have two things in common. He apparently did not stay in the House of Representatives. I did not get a seat on the Arkansas Supreme Court. So uh, we are both people who are frustrated politicians decided to go do change also elsewhere. He dissolved a successful real estate firm, attended and earned a Master of Divinity uh, degree from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He is both a Southern Baptist and a Roman Catholic and uh, just a regular badass believer. And he served as a rural congregation as a pastor while in seminary, experienced ethnic discrimination in numerous situations. And as a result of all this, continued his theological training and obtained a doctorate. The focus of his academic pursuit was at social ethics within the contemporary US thought, specifically how religion affects race, class, and gender oppression, and Latinx religiosity within this country, in liberation theology in the Caribbean and Latin America, and in postmodern and colonial social theory. Since obtaining his doctorate in 1999, he has authored several hundred articles and over 32 books. I cannot keep up with the man. He writes faster than I can read. And he writes just fantastic stuff. However, he's not an Ivy Tower scholar. Miguel De La Torre is a scholar and an activist involved with liberation efforts surrounding immigration, sexuality, racism, sexism, torture, capital punishment, worker justice, abusive and homicidal policing, and a numerous other subjects. I cannot name them all and still give you time to hear the, the, the uh, Zoom. Decolonizing Christianity. His latest book follows up his 2018 book, Burying White Privilege, Resur Resurrecting a Badass Christianity. He's the first author I have ever known with a reverend before his name who used badass in a book called title, and I love him even more because of that. Burying White Christianity directly addressed white supremacy and white Christian nationalism. We are fortunate he is willing to talk with us this evening about his latest work issues surrounding colonized Christianity, and the urgent need for followers of Jesus to constantly liberate ourselves from and totally reject, and I'm quoting him now, quote, white Christianity and all those within our community who for monetary rewards or access to power, positions in power or colonized minds peddle its lies. That's on page 206. Dr. Della Torre will speak about 40 minutes will then respond to questions from me for about 15 minutes, then to questions submitted by viewers for about 15 minutes before making a closing statement. Please remain on the session after his closing statement to hear announcements because there's more to come. New Millennium Church 
thanks Garbo and Anna Hearn of Pyramid Art Books and Custom Framing, our members, for hosting this Zoom session. And now, without further ado, let me introduce the badass Dr. Miguel De La Torre, so he can talk about decolonizing Christianity. Take it away, man. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I, I was asked to talk a little bit about the book. Uh, and in a way, this particular book, Decolonizing Christianity, is a follow-up, as was mentioned, to an earlier book I wrote in 2018 called Burying White Privilege. And when I wrote that book, um, a lot of people critiqued it by saying that I, you know, I described what was wrong, but I never provided a solution. I never provided an answer on how to move forward. All I did was just be descriptive about what white supremacy does to communities of color. So I decided to write this book as a response to that critique. In the very beginning of the book, I begin by asking that if there is an abusive relationship in where a spouse is being abused, do we expect that the abused spouse provides the solution to their abuse? I mean, that's ridiculous. And yet that is exactly what uh, you, uh, white Eurocentric people want of people of color to not only say what's wrong, but also to provide the solution for their oppression. And here's what I began to realize. Even if the answer is given, they're not interested. And because the answer is quite obvious. This is Matthew 25 verses 31 through 46. Feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, welcome the alien that lives among you, provide health care to the sick, and to provide uh, prison reform uh, to those who are incarcerated. We know what the answer is. We just are not willing to do it. So why waste my time trying to come up with a solution to the abuse that my people are suffering. That's kind of the reason why I wrote Decolonizing Christianity, Becoming Badass Believer. I did not want to speak truth to power because I argue power already knows what the truth is. Instead, I want to speak truth to the powerless because I suspect all too often our minds have become so colonized that we unconditionally and uncritically accept white Christianity, white theology, white philosophy, white liturgy, white history, without interrogating it to try to understand how our very use of Eurocentric Christianity contributes to our own oppression. Therefore, I want to begin by clearly stating that all manifestation of white Christianity is detrimental to people of color. When the French during the revolution cried out, liberté, égalité, and franinette, liberty, egal equality, and fraternity, they never expected that this applied to their colonized people in Vietnam, in Haiti, or in Algiers. When they gave us that slogan, liberation was only for white French people. When I was a small boy in Queens, New York, um, we would have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And even in first grade, when I got to the part of and liberty and justice for all, I already knew that did not apply to me. As a small boy, I already realized that this liberty and justice did not apply to Latinx folk. So if this is true, then I have to realize that 
that that that Eurocentric philosophy and theology is inherently problematic for communities of color. And the best example of this is how many white Christians voted for Trump. Eight in 10 white evangelicals cast a vote for Trump in 2020. Strong majorities of both white mainline Protestant, white Catholics, and white Mormons all voted for Trump. But again, this should be nothing new because the rise of white nationalist Christianity has been going on now, well, since the foundation of the Republic, but in our modern time, it specifically took off in 1940. In 1940, and I, and I talk about this in the book, 5,000 titans of industry gathered at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City um, to, to attend the National Association of manufacturers. These are the CEOs of Standard Oil, of General Motors, of Sears, of General Electric, of Mutual Life, the major corporations in the United States. And they were down in the dumps. Remember, the, the, the Great Depression was winding up. Um, and since the collapse of the economy in 1929, there was this um, New Deal that placed the blame of the economic collapse upon uh, major US um, corporations. So when these titans of industry gathered in New York, there was a clear anti-New Deal rhetoric um, and sentiment. The problem is they had a hard time selling their message. At that meeting, Reverend James Fifield um, gave a sermon in where he basically claimed that Christianity and capitalism are soulmates. And that rather than um, blame corporations for the Great Depression, it is corporations that will save America. He is the one that um, spearheaded the campaign to include under God in the Pledge of Allegiance and on all our currency. J, uh, J. Howard Pugh, president of Sun Oil, was um, fascinated by Fifield. So he backrolled him. And, and, and Fifield began this, this merging of Christianity and capitalism to make it one. During this time, in the 50s, about 10 years later, uh, Pew began to sponsor this unknown tent revivalist by the name of Billy Graham. And through the Hearst Publishing Corporation, which was also part of, of, of these titans of industry, they made Billy Graham into a household name. And while he was preaching the gospel, he also preached against the New Deal, the Fair Deal, the New Frontier, and the Great Society. He preached against everything that had to do with any kind of social safety net. In fact, Graham, during the 50s, would say that Martin Luther King was wrong, that racial reconciliation will only occur during Jesus' second coming. And what King should be doing is not trying to bring racial reconciliation legally, but changes, changing people's heart by converting them to Jesus Christ. Billy Graham joins Richard Nixon in beginning what at that time was the start of cultural wars. The cultural war at the time was the Vietnam War. So anyone who was against Vietnam and the war in Vietnam was therefore against us. And if they're against us, they do not, they're against Christian values. This is what Nixon meant by the, uh, mo, uh, the um, silent majority. Um, Nixon was the first president to, 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 empl uh, to, to employ the Southern strategy 
remember when um, L LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act, uh, there was this realization that the Democrats who were the major supporters of Jim and Jane Crow in the South were now going to become Republicans. And Nixon, with the help of Graham, began to attract Republicans who were anti-civil rights with um, racial messages. Now, until Nixon, basically, you just say things you know, like, we support Jim and Jane Crow, and that was enough to get you elected. But now with, with civil rights, one had to learn how to say those things without saying them. And probably the best person um, that, that mastered that technique was Ronald Reagan. Now remember Ronald Reagan, when he gets the nomination uh, for the Republican party, the first thing he does is go to Philadelphia, Mississippi, where if you remember in June of 64, uh, that's where the three civil rights workers were killed. Um, and when Reagan goes to Philadelphia, Mississippi, he starts preaching about state rights and the importance of state rights. Now, this is in 1980. So everyone in the audience who is voting is old enough to remember the killing of the three civil rights workers and the usage of, civil right, of state rights as a way of pushing back at civil rights. And of course, Reagan would talk, would, would say things like, um, you know, a buck, uh, a young buck buying T-bone steaks using their welfare checks, or I mean, food stamps, or he gave us the infamous welfare queen. So he had all these racial um, uh, language that got the message through without appearing racist. Um, during the same time, Ray Rich, who is the one who created the moral majority, finds an anti-civil rights preacher named Jerry Falwell to head the moral majority. Now, while all this is going on, because I find this time of the, this historical period an interesting transition um, in, 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 in how Christianity uh, becomes ra uh, racialized. You have Lee Otwater. Now, Lee Otwater was the GOP strategist um, for, for, um, for both Reagan and, and later the um, campaign manager for Bush. He says this interesting quote, and, and, and it's, it's a long quote, but it's worth repeating. Um, and he says, and I quote, you start out in 1954 by saying the N-word, the N-word, the N-word. Obviously, he, he said it, I won't. By 1968, you can't say N-word. That hurts you, backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, state rights, and all that stuff. You're getting so abstract now that you're talking about cutting taxes and all these things you're talking about are totally economic things. And maybe uh, that is part of it. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, that we are doing away with racial problem one way or another. You follow me? Because obviously sitting around and saying we want to cut this is much more abstract than even the busing thing and a hell of a lot more abstract than N-word, N-word. So any way you look at it, race is coming on, is coming on the back burner. In other words, what Art Water does for the Republican Party, what he does for Reagan, what he does for Bush Sr., is that he invents the dog whistle. Uh, so when Bush is running for office and he is losing to Dukakis, the governor of Massachusetts, he gives us, of course, Willie, Hal Willie Halton, uh, which you, you will probably well remember was an ex-con who was on furlough, who murdered a white woman. And what uh, Artwater does was make commercials so it looked like um, uh, Willie Harton was, as Artwater would say, the running mate of the caucus. So here's the two historical lessons. Trump is not a new phenomenon. I, I know we look at Trump and we say, this is horrible, he's so racist. Trump truly represents white Christian America. 
Uh, when, when Biden says after January 6th insurrection, this is not who America is, Biden is wrong. This is exactly who America is. Trump is not nothing new. He just is the uh, total representation of, right, of what white Christianity America is. And this white nationalist Christianity is hostile, if not death dealing to communities of color. Now, before I go on confronting white Christianity, it behooves us to really first confront ourselves. And, and let me be very clear. When I say the word white, I am speaking about ontological whiteness. I'm not talking about skin pigmentation. You could have people of color, you could have black people, Latinx people, Asian people who are white. That means they see with white eyes and they defend white supremacy. Some of them um, sit on the Supreme Court, others um, are senators from South Carolina. These are individuals who defend white supremacy and go so far as saying that there is no racism in the United States. And, and, and I speak as someone um, who was also ontologically white. Um, and, and what that means is my mind was so colonized that I saw myself through the eyes of the dominant culture. When I was a young man um, in my 20s, I was driving up to New York City in my red Capri, listening to the Gran Combo. Uh, my hair was down to my shoulder, it was flapping in the rings with the window rolled down. And somewhere on New Jersey, I get pulled over by the state trooper. And the state trooper, the first thing he says to me was, can I search your car? And I said, yeah, sure, go right ahead. So he starts searching my car. And I asked him, what are you looking for? And he said, well, you see Latino young men from Dade County, Miami, driving to up north, to the Northeast, usually a, 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 a trafficking in cocaine. And we just wanna make sure that there's no cocaine coming up to the Northeast. So even before Frisk and Search was popularized, um, I know what it is to be you know, stopped and search. But here's the thing, as I was driving away, what went through my mind was not the indignity of being stopped while under the influence of being a Latino. What I found, what went through my mind was, thank God the cops are doing their jobs. You see, my mind was so colonized that I literally was seeing and defining myself through the eyes of the dominant culture. So basically, the first act of liberation has to be the decolonization of my mind. I have learned to interpret ethics, history, theology through Eurocentric uh, paradigms. The question is, these paradigms have profited off of the mar marginalized of the world and therefore these ethics and histories and theologies and philosophies become blasphemous. And, and, and we end up embracing concepts um, that, that contribute to our own oppression. And when we do that, when our minds are so colonized, God vomits. Jose Mati, who is my intellectual mentor, once wrote, El vino de plátano y si sale agrio, sigue siendo nuestro vino. Allow me to translate for those who have yet to learn the language of the angels. Um, we will make our wine out of plantains. And even if it comes out sour, it is still our wine. What Jose Mati in, in 1895 was trying to explain is that if we adopt Eurocentric philosophy, it will never be our wine. We must make wine with our own indigenous roots. And even if we don't have grapes, we use whatever symbols we have so that the wine be ours, even if we get it wrong, even if it tastes sour. 
we cannot pour our wine, our liberationist wine, into the old Eurocentric wineskins because the wine will be spoiled and the skins will burst. What that means is I must learn to see myself through my own eyes, read the Bible through my own culture, and practice my faith through my own symbols. And while I'm concerned with my community and communities of color, and that's who I wrote the book for, those who continue to be white, either by skin pigmentation or by philosophy, the only way they can ever get saved, I'm a good old Southern Baptist, so the only way they could get saved is to crucify their whiteness and follow the God that is not white, the God of the marginalized, the God of the oppressed. So what does it mean to move towards this badass Christianity? And I would argue that one needs to learn how to em embrace hopelessness. I took a group of students to Cuenavaca, Mexico to learn from the poor about neoliberalism, how our riches in this country is directly linked to the poverty of the squatter villages in Mexico. And after we spend a day in squatter villages, at, you know, my white students and I sat down to unpack what we saw. And I'll never forget there was this one white woman who said, you know, this is horrible the way these people live. But when I saw the little girl, I saw the hope in her eyes. At that point, I had an epistemological meltdown because my response was, I'm not quite sure what you saw in her eyes, but in another 10 years, she's gonna be turning tricks to put food on the table, or she's gonna be stuck in an abusive marriage. There is no hope for this little girl. She will grow up into poverty, have children in poverty, and those children will probably be poorer than she ever was. For the oppressed and wretched of the earth, there is no hope. They will continue to live and die early. Now, I know what I'm saying sounds problematic because after all, the gifts of the spirits are what? Love, joy, peace, and hope. And here I am saying that hope has become a middle-class privilege that excuses those of the dominant culture from doing anything. See, as long as my student was able to look at the hope in the girl's eyes, she didn't have to do anything about her poverty because it was in God's hand. All things work for good for those who love God and who have been called according to God's purposes. That's not necessarily true for the wretched of the earth who are dying in childbirth. And part of this understanding of hope as a middle-class privilege comes from our own word in Spanish for hope, which is esperanza. Esperanza, the way we say hope, comes from the word esperar, which means to wait. We're just not sure what we're waiting for. I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard um, the story about the, um, the little girl after a big storm throwing all the starfish is back into the ocean that got washed up to the beach. And, 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 and as she's throwing the starfish back, there's a little old man, an old man there, a grumpy old man going, you know, you ain't going to save them all, but she picks one up and says, but I'll make a difference in this one and throws it back. And the whole congregation goes, oh, how cute, what a nice lesson. <clears throat> I'm the grumpy old man. Because what we always do is we lift up the one that makes it, and ignore all the other ones that are dying in the beach. I lived in the barrios of New York, in the slums of New York. Most of my friends of childhood are six feet under right now. I made it out of the barrio. I have a PhD, I teach at a university, I'm placed on a pedestal. Look, a Latino man can make it out of poverty. 
And as long as I'm on that pedestal, as long as I'm that starfish that made it, we could ignore all the other ones that are being crushed alive in the gears of neoliberalism and global capitalism. Moltmann, who is known as the prophet of hope, relies on Hegel's salvation history. And what that means is that history is moving in an upward progressive manner. But I don't believe that. History is chaotic. History is nonlinear. History could, could, could have, we could have a golden age tomorrow or we could have another Holocaust. In other words, history does not follow a path towards some salvation future. And, and part of the problem is capitalism is a salvation history that you know the rising tide will lift our boats and Marxism is a salvation history that the state will wither away and that we're all gonna live in utopia. These are part of the European enlightenment philosophy that has infected Christianity so that we now look at history as though it's always gonna get better. But not all that history is, is just using the past to justify the future. So when Martin Luther King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, here's where I probably disagree with King. The arc of the moral universe could care less which way it bends. And if we're going, and if it's going to bend towards justice, we are the ones that have to do the bending because the universe leans mostly towards injustice. Or as the, as the uh, writer of Ecclesiastic once wrote, vanity of vanity, says the teacher, absolute fertility, everything is meaningless. So why is this hopelessness important for me? My people live in Saturday. In other words, all they know is the crucifixion and the gore and, 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 and the blood of Friday. That's all they know. There is some talk about a Sunday resurrection, but we are not there yet. And if we embrace that hope too quickly, that hope becomes the way we are domesticated. When I went to Auschwitz, there's this sign over the main gate that says, work will set you free. If I was a Jew walking through the gates of Auschwitz and I was to read that sign, it would give me hope that if I keep my head down, if I don't make waves, if I don't rebel, I might survive if I work hard enough. But you see that hope is a form of domestication for those who are about to be led to the slaughter. When I realize I have nothing to lose, that's when I become more radical. When I realize that no matter what I do, the structures will still try to grind me into dust, that's when I become badass. So what is this badass Christianity? It rejects the easy fixes that hope provides. And instead, it recognizes that to be hopeless does not mean to be in despair. Despair is when you roll up in a fetus position and gnash your teeth. The opposite of hope, of hope is desperation, not despair. Desperation means that if I stay, I'm going to die. But if I do something, I may still die, but I might have a chance of living. The reason why people cross a desert to enter this country knowing that every four days, five brown bodies perish in the desert, is be not because of despair, because then they won't do it. It's because of a desperation that they have no other choice but to put their bodies on the line in order to maybe get to liberation. And here's 
what I try to tell my, share with my students, do you fight for justice because you think you're going to win? Because we're not, we're not gonna win. Neoliberalism has won. Racism is going to get a lot worse. Um, racism will be part of the DNA of this country for centuries to come. We are gonna hate Asians and Latino people for a long time. The poor will continue to become poor. So why bother with justice? And even to ask that question shows a certain economic privilege that one can walk away from this. But for those of us who can't walk away, we fight for justice, not because we're going to win, we don't fight for justice because we're gonna get an extra ruby in our crown when we get to heaven. We fight for justice because it defines our very faith. And more importantly, it defines our very humanity. The reason why I struggle for justice, it's not because I'm gonna win. I struggle because I have no other choice. It defines who I am as a human being. And when I realize that, it provides me with more energy to do more praxis. One of the reasons why a lot of social workers don't last long in that profession is because they enter thinking they're going to change the world. And in fact, when they realize that things are only getting worse, they quit the job profession, they do something else with their lives. I've been working on immigration issues now for about 20 years. It's a lot worse now than it was when I began. I am not discouraged because I know I'm not going to win and I'm going to die. And when I die, they, we're still gonna have a horrible immigration crisis. So that doesn't impact the work I do for liberation. See, what then, does be, what then becomes our, re, our badass response? We have been domesticated so that we go to the police department to get a permit from the police department to protest the police department for police brutality. We have domesticated protests so that we can do it and feel good about ourselves while the structures know that this protest will change absolutely nothing. I have um, my white liberal students come to me once in a while and say, Dr. De La Torre, we're all gonna go get arrested for this cause or the other, as if getting arrested provides them with their liberal credentials. To which I usually respond, I'm a Latino man, I don't have to try to get arrested. You know, I've been detained enough already just because I'm a Latino man. Thank you very much. So we've, we've developed a system that I could, you know, that people could, you know, now don't get me wrong. There are times when getting the arrest, arrested becomes the response to our acts, but we don't have to go trying to do that because it takes the focus away from the cause and puts it on ourselves. Um, I give an example when, you know, I've been detained by Border Patrol many times for the work I do with undocumented. And the last thing I ever want to do is get arrested because then all the court fees are going to be to try to keep me out of jail. And that money is needed to continue to provide food and water and medicine to the undocumented. So if I'm not going to follow the rules that have been established to domesticate me, what becomes my response? And here in the book is where I talk about what I've been calling an ethics para joder. Now, for those of you who know Spanish, I apologize for my cursing because joder is a certain Spanish word that is equivalent to an English word uh, that is four, letter lo four letters long, begins with F and ends with K. So I call this ethics para joder or in a more PG, PG way of saying it, an ethics that screws with the systems, that screws with the social structures. This is Jesus who does this ethics para Jorel when he walks into the temple and overturns the table. So 
Where do I get this from? Communities of color all have trickster images as part of their roots, as part of their community. Going back to, we must do this Christianity based on our own cultural symbols. So I know the African-American communities has bear bear and bear rabbit. The indigenous communities has coyote and spider. My Latinx community has Cantinfra and Juan Bobo and Pepito. My specific Cuban community has Elegua. Elegua is the Yoruba Afro-Cuban God, which is the trickster. And it just so happens Elegua is my Orisha. Um, and, and, and what this is, is a, a, an ethics that is designed to subvert the social structures that have been established to maintain oppression and to provide a space for protest, but that space does not threaten the overall structures. When the structures have won, when neoliberalism has won, when racism is the law of the land, when ethnic discrimination is the, into the very fabric of this nation's DNA, what Christians of color need to begin to learn is how do they nonviolently lie so that they could discover truth? How do they cheat? so that they could feed the hungry? How do they steal so that the poor could have clothes? How do they joke so they could say truth without being killed? How do they disrupt and deceive? These things that are seen as vices by white Christian theology are the virtues of the oppressed of the world. Thank you. Well. This is a good introduction to decolonizing Christianity and becoming badass believers. Dr. De La Torre, what have been the reactions thus far to decolonizing Christianity? You, to, to, to the answers that you gave, the, pres the prescription that you have given. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the book has sold well. It, it's, it's, it's selling quite well, um, but I, I'm not getting that pushback that I got with the first book. And I'm wondering it's because I ended up writing this book to respond to the first one. So maybe some people are afraid to push back too hard because I may come up with a third one, which doesn't matter because I am. I'm in the middle of, of writing the third book right now, the, 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 the trilogy of this badass. And it's gonna be called um, Apartheid America, a uh, badass Christian response. Um, and, and what it does, it, 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 it picks up where, um, where, where J January 6th occurred and talks about this movement towards this hopeless future of an apartheid America. That, I mean, we always had one, no question about it. Um, maybe during the 70s and 80s, we began to move away from it. That's why you have that backlash of um, the Reagan, Reagan years. Um, with the election of Obama, you know, the, the, the ultimate horror that the White House is no longer white because a black man's living in it, um, gave us a Donald Trump as a form of a corrective. But this, this, this rise of Trump um, is pushing this nation now with these uh, voter registration laws, with the Senate and the, and, the, and the Congress unwilling to do anything about it uh, because they don't have the votes. Uh, we are moving back to an apartheid America. And that's what I'm saying. History is not a linear upward progression. In this case, we moved up a little bit with, 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 with Obama and, and, you know, and literally people of color voting and making change. So now we're you know, going in a different direction. How do congregations do this decolonizing work? I mean, I hear you talking about individuals mm -hmm. learning how to screw with the system. Uh, how do congregations do this decolonizing work? 
I could give you several examples of, 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 of actual live events of what it could. Um, when I came up with this ethics para joder, I was basing it on a group called the Young Lords. The Young Lords were a gang in New York City and Chicago, as a matter of fact. They began in Chicago, they, they had a chapter in New York City. This is in the late 60s. So they go to the first, uh, Primera Iglesia Metodorista, the first Methodist church of Spanish Harlem. And they tell the pastor they want to have a food closet, uh, a clothes closet, um, education for the young, lawyers. And, and the pastor looks at them and says, ah, you bunch of commies, get out of here. So they showed up next Sunday. They picked up the pastor, they threw him out. They nailed on the door, uh, the people's church, and they began to do all these things. So this ethics para joder holds institutions responsible to the rhetoric, rhetoric that they proclaim. Mm. So how does congregations do this? By holding the church to the rhetoric that they say they believe in. Even if it means picking up the pastor and throwing them out. Um, the other thing that they did, which I thought was fat, was hilarious. Um, back in the late 60s, the sanitation department would pick up trash in black and brown neighborhoods whenever they had extra time. So the young lords swept all the streets, the streets, they put all the garbage in bags and they put them on the corners and they called a the sanitation department. The sanitation department laughed at them and says, yeah, we'll come up whenever we feel like it. So they took all those garbage bags, they went to Third Avenue, they built a, 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 a war of garbage and then they set it on fire doing rush hour traffic. Now, obviously, this way of screwing with the system um, not only brought out the cops and beat them up, but it also brought out the New York Times who started doing stories in the sanitation department. And because of that, now garbage is picked up on Mondays and Thursdays in both brown and black neighborhoods. So this ethics para joder is to push the structures towards the justice that they proclaim they believe in. Now, I could go on with other stories more modern. I, I work with no more deaths down in the border with immigration, and, and we've done a, a, some of this stuff as well. What are some of the challenges that will confront decolonized people as, uh, as we try to decolonize and as we encounter folks who are colonized and want to stay that way? Yeah, I think the major challenge is how difficult, if not impossible, it is to decolonize my own mind. I mean, I've been working on trying to decolonize my mind and I'm nowhere close to that yet. It's still, I mean, the fact that I write my books in English <laughs> shows how colonized I continue to be. Uh, the fact that um, I, I, you know, that, that things like tenure and and things like um, book contracts are, are important to me, shows how colonized my mind is. You know, um, to, to, when white scholars dismiss my book, that hurts deeply because my mind still looks for approval from a dominant culture that will never approve of what I say or do. So we're talking about a way of life that I have gone through now for almost six decades, that just to say now, okay, that's it, I'm, 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 I'm decolonized, it's not that easy. I will die still being a colonized man, you know? And, and, and that's the, one of the major challenges um, that I face. And the, and the other challenge is, you know, when the dominant Eurocentric culture controls the academy, the polit political structures, the judicial structures, the economic structures. If we don't play by the games, we will starve and die. So it, 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 it's this constant, how much can I bend before I break? You know, which, which also is a major challenge in trying to, to find my own liberation and the liberation of my people. One last question. How do you get how do you get recharged? I mean, this is hard work and you do it. You do it in the classroom. You do it uh, in the community. You do it around the world. How do you get, how do you stay up? 
quite frankly, it sounds counterintuitive, but but being hopeless. Because by embracing hopelessness, I realize I'm not the savior. I'm not going to save the world. I'm not going to do anything to make the, you know, to make the, to, to bring about, you know, worldwide change. That's not on me. My task is to be faithful to the praxis of liberation. That's what my faith calls me to do. And I do that with great joy. So I don't get depressed. I don't get, you know, overwhelmed because I'm not going to be able to do it all. And I'm not going to change the world. And, it's, it's, it, and it doesn't depend on me. So one of the most liberating things that I ever went through is embracing hopelessness mm. and just becoming faithful to the work that I've been called to do. I'm struck by faithful and hopelessness. Ordinarily, yeah. religious people think the two are not counter to each other, but combined. And you've just you've, you've separated them. Yeah, I, I, and, 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 and quite frankly, I, I have a very happy and joyful life. Um, you know, I, I, I deal with horrific things in my writing. But it's not that I have so much callous because they, you know, it, it, you know, when, when when I see some of the children, it you know, it breaks my heart. But I keep doing what I can do, knowing that I, I'm not going to change the world. I could just make this little corner that I happen to be standing in a little bit better. Okay, so you. So in one way, you're saying I'm not changing the world, but I am going to pick up. I'm still going to pick up starfish. I'm going to pick up the starfish, knowing that by lifting one up, that's not that doesn't make me a hero, and that doesn't solve anything. Okay. I I have to the, the 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 stench of all the other ones dying on the beach chokes all hope out of my nostrils to the point that I cannot breathe. Okay, now I promised Anna that I was gonna let uh, her share with us some of the questions uh, and she and Garbo are moderating the chat. So uh, folks, if you've got questions for Dr. De La Torre, uh, you've got to get them to Anna and to Garbo, put them in the chat. and. They are our screeners, so that we'll make sure that the questions are germane to the conversation. Anna, Gabo, do you have questions you want to share? Not at the moment. I have also um, allowed everyone to unmute. I know we were filtering, um, but I would like to hear questions from the audience. Y'all go ahead and sure. you can unmute and ask them if, if you would like. I think we have a uh, John Comstock. Well, hey. hey, John Comstock. Hey, John. Hey, I, I will tell you what, uh, several weeks ago, uh, Judge Griffin uh, cited this book to me as one of several books I should read. I'm two thirds of the way through it right now. I apologize in advance. I'm an old white male, 71 years old. But I, I read it and I tell my wife, and I know this will sound very arrogant. This man thinks like I do. <laughs> but you know, but, but let's remember also when I say white, I'm not talking about skin pigmentation. And and I know, I know yeah. exactly what you mean, and I yeah. totally uh, accept that point. One thing that I get uh, confused about, I accept your point about, you know, the abuser. I'm sorry, the abused should not be required to uh, lay out all the solutions. The people that are doing it, this this white nationalist, let's say society, knows what the answer is, and it's, and it's the answer that you gave, uh, in, in, in Matthew. But on at, at my at my own personal level, I try to do things in a kind of a leadership type way, and then I think, well, hold it, am I? Because I also hear people telling me, John, you don't need to be taking such a lead on something you need to learn to step back and let other people marginalized people get in front 
there. And so I, I, I have, I feel that conflict sometimes because yeah. I'm trying to take advantage of my, of my status, which is a, a white lawyer, a, a former judge. Uh, and so I, I have all this privilege. And so I try to use that privilege to, to an advantage. I hear what you're saying. And, and let me, let me respond by using myself as an example. Um, I am a sexist. Okay. It doesn't matter that I believe in equal pay for women or that I march with women or that I wear that funny pink hat. None of that matters. I am a sexist because the structures are designed to be sexist for me. Yes. Okay. When I work on issues of gender equality, I can never say what it means to be a woman because I have absolutely no idea. I have, you know, I have no idea whatsoever. So, so for me to talk about issues of, uh, of, of, of gender equality, I can never talk about how women feel or how to treat, I, I don't know. What I can talk about with total integrity is how I benefit because I'm not a woman. I could only talk about how women continue to be oppressed so that I could have benefits and privileges through their oppression. So when I deal with, when I talk about these issues, and, you know, and, and not just issues of sexism, but uh, issues of heterosexism, um, you know, all those issues. I only focus on how I am privileged by my male privilege. Yeah. Okay. And now I can say that with total integrity. Um, and, and, and in a way, now, now let, me, let me turn it around. When I talk about immigration, immediately I'm dismissed as an angry Latino. When you, as a white man, <clears throat> talk about immigration, you don't have a dog in that fight. So they'll listen to you before they listen to me. Now, don't get me wrong. I could speak for myself. Thank you very much. I don't need you to speak for me. Mm -hmm. But strategically, they're going to listen to you because you're not an angry Latino like I am. So how do you use that privilege you have by talking about how the structure is designed to privilege you <clears throat> at my expense. And I think that's why, that's why I would tell my students, <clears throat> they need to be involved in two different causes. One that touches their skin and one that they, have, they don't have a dog in that fight at all, but only speak as the oppressor. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the group? Dr. De La Torre, uh, what's the what's the composition of your of your student body at Elip, in the, your your classes, and how do they how do they come how do they shape up? Yeah, Elif is a very leftist liberal school. Um, and, and, and we are known, you know, many times theological schools have a reputation. Our reputation is social justice. That's what we work in. Um, people like Vincent Harding was my, was my professor, was one of my the professors at ILIF. He was a dear colleague of mine and passed away. And we all know that Vincent Harding was the speechwriter for MLK. Uh, Tink Tink is one of the leading indigenous scholars in the country. Uh, he just retired. He, um, and he rejects Christianity because of what Christianity did, has done to the indigenous people. So a lot of our professors aren't even Christians. Our, our student body is comprised of Christians and Muslims and Jews and Mormons and, and Hindus and, 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 and atheists and agnostics. I mean, we have a very diverse student body when it comes to faith traditions. Um, and about a good 40% of the faculty are of color. So it's, it's really a very unique place in that respect. That's not to say we don't have our own problems because sometimes white um, liberal racism is worse than uh, conservative racism. And, and, we, and we struggle with that. 
when you, I'm sorry, I didn't want to get ahead of someone who else wanted to ask the question. No, continue, proceed. When you interrogate these issues uh, as a scholar, as an activist, and you run across folks in the political world uh, who push back with you, what kind of pushback do they give you? A lot of it is um, that as white people, they're the ones that are the ones who are really being oppressed now. That um, as a Latino man, I have much more privilege than they do. Um, um, that um, you know that kind of stuff is 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 is, is the main pushback I get. Um, How do you keep other... from vomiting? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and quite frankly, I just ignore it. Um, I, I, I've Katie Cannon was my um, was on my was was one of my uh, dissertation committee members, and Katie Cannon is, is the one that helped us who who, who gave the contribution of womenist theology to the academy. And Katie would always say, you know, I, I refuse to, to have any debates or conversation with the Klan. Yeah. You know, I refuse to have any conversation with people who are just outright racist. That I, I have no time for it. That's not my mission. That's not my calling. I speak, as I said earlier, to those who are powerless. That's who my audience is. That's who I'm talking with. If a clan member happens to hear me and they learn something, hallelujah, that's nice, totally unintentional. My focus is to marginalize communities. Um, so when, I, when, when people push back like that, I, I really just ignore it. I just delete it. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't bother even responding. Uh, when, you know, and, and, you know, but sometimes we, I do public talks and and some of this does come out. I try to be gentle, but at the same time, I, I'm like, you know, I show them why what they're asking is really fundamentally racist in what they're asking, as 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 politely as I pop as I possibly can do it. Um, and, and and to be honest with you, sometimes I have gotten death threats um, because of my talks, and 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 so so that's also part of it. I, I'm afraid. Daryl, you have a question. Need to unmute. Unmute, Daryl. There you go. There you okay. Go. Well, one thing I'd like to to know uh, is uh, you went to Southern Seminary. Yes. Uh, was that in the late seventies, maybe? That was no. That was in the nineties. In the nineties. Uh, right when um, it became a fundamentalist school, I was there when Mola became the president and moved the seminary into fundamentalism. My, my. Okay. Well, that night? Go ahead. <laughs> well the, the folks that taught ethics when I were there, were there, were not there when you were. <laughs> no, um, Glenn Stassen was my professor of ethics. Okay. Uh, and um, he's, he's the one I, I learned ethics from. I know, Glenn, very well. My, my, um, question is somewhat, um, you know, part of the, I'm influenced by um, a rather liberal Baptist preacher named Carlisle Marnie. Um, and he said, basically, uh, there, there are two problems that we have. Uh, one's a good thing. He says, in the beginning was relation. And pointing to the fact that uh, God created us to be in relationship. And that relationship also includes um, the other human beings that we live with. And uh, he said the main problem that we have with that, particularly in this culture, is individualism. So essentially everything is about me. And indeed, the gospel that I grew up with, the gospel of uh, um, Jesus came to save us from our sins, and you accept Jesus into your life as your personal Savior, and you are saved from your sins, and 
therefore you go to heaven when you die. Um, that gospel really is fundamentally just all about me. <laughs> and the kinds of issues that we're talking about of systemic, the systemic issues that have to do with our relationships with one another. Um, we have a hard, I have a hard time. I think we all have a hard time doing anything, even seeking to know what to do because uh, basically we're seeing it from a very myoptic point of view, which is just us. And um, I'm wondering how, and, and you know, I would say even you, you know, you're, uh, to me, it's somewhat uh, kind of a tip of the hat to con our consumerism that, that your book is called Becoming a Badass Christian. <laughs> I mean, like that's a good thing. Um, badass is kind of a, a word that that we is cool, I guess, as we would used to say. Um, so, I, and I guess I wonder, you know, isn't it, that's kind of focused on, uh, you know, the individual as well. And so what's your question? What's your question? Darryl? Well, the experience is how the question is, how do we, uh, how do we get out of uh, our uh, preoccupation with who we are uh, in order to actually be able to understand who people who aren't like us really are and to address the issues then and be a part of the solution uh, to actually help uh, these who are simply left out, which is the majority of the people on the planet. Um, well, well, let me just answer that last question very quickly and then go back to the um, individualism for a moment. Um, very quickly, I don't think we can. Uh, yeah, I, I think that this has been so ingrained into our very being that to think that somehow I'm going to radically change and now be this different way of being um, could become a little bit um, self uh, delusion. Um, I am, you know, and, and you mentioned, I mean, no matter how much I try to become more communal, no matter how much I try to become more rooted in my own culture and reject your centric thought, I've been doing it for too many decades. It, it, it's second nature, it's a habit, it is literally written into my DNA. Um, so, this is a lifelong struggle. Um, there's a phrase about working out just salvation and fear and trembling. I am trying to work this out and fear and trembling, knowing that I'm constantly I'm going to be failing and falling short. Maybe that's why I'm a good Southern Baptist because you know I'm very much into sin here. Um, <laughs> but, but 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 talk about Southern Baptist. This is earlier to what you were saying. Um, I may be a Southern Baptist minister, but I haven't gone to a Southern Baptist church in maybe 30 years and have no intention of going to anyone in the future. The only reason I'm still a Southern Baptist is just to screw with them. Uh, because, uh, you know, I was on CNN not long ago and talking about LGBTQI civil rights, and I made sure they had under my name, Southern Baptist minister. So that, and you know, that's the end of, and this allows me to write in some of the Baptist journals as well. So that's the only reason I'm a Southern Baptist, not because I in any way, shape or form agree with anything that they're doing. Um, so, and that's part of it, but, but, but going back to the, to the individualism and communal thing, you're right. You know, how can I not be individualistic? I mean, my whole cult, this whole culture is individualistic. I've been taught how to be individualistic and look out for number one since before while drinking my mother's milk. I mean, it literally is everything that I've been taught even before I knew I was being taught anything. But the attempt that I'm trying to do for example, reading the Bible in Spanish, and I'll give you just an example. When you read in, when, when you read in Spanish um, something like um, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much in, in the book of James, right? The word righteous um, from the Hebrew word, I mean, from the, from the Greek word uh, was translated into Latin into the word utitia. Now, the English folk, you know, King James people, 
they translated uditya into righteousness. So to be righteous, I could be righteous on a deserted island, right? I mean, if I'm on a deserted island, I could, you know, pray, think good thoughts, carry myself in a godly way. But we, we in the Spanish world translated that word into justicia, justice. So while the English people are reading the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, I'm reading la oración del hombre justo, the, the prayer of the just man availeth much. I cannot do justice on a deserted island. The word itself means I must be in community by which to do justice with. So even as we read the Bible in, different, in, in our different languages, when I read the Bible in English, I am reading a very individualistic text that is based on my salvation and me being righteous. When I read it in Spanish, I'm reading about our, our people being um, saved and, 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 and doing justice in community. So it's a communal reading. And this is one of the things I'm trying to get at when I say we need to go back to our own cultural roots and reject this Eurocentric way of reading the biblical text. Yeah, I think you have to do that. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, I think the black community is essentially saying the same thing. Um, we've, been doing, but, we've been doing that forever. We've been doing that forever, Daryl. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 heard, we heard the slave preachers say, you know, obey your masters. And we had to say, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Yeah. So uh, I, I guess the, the thing about the, in, that the, we can't, it can't be changed. The individualism is our culture. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that, um, well, I don't believe that. The, for the same reason of what you're saying, you know, you're simply saying we can't necessarily work together because our cultures are different. And in order for you to be who you are, you kind of have to, you know, you have to be your, your own. No, I, I'm not saying we can't work together. What I'm saying is you're going to have to crucify all your whiteness and worship the black God and the Latino Jesus in order for us to be able to work together. That's right. Yeah. But it's I mean, a giving up of, um, it's a giving up of privilege. It's a giving exactly. up of power. In the same yeah. way that I have to give up and crucify my maleness and crucify my light skin. I'm a light skinned Latino. I have a lot of privilege in the Latino community because of that. Mm -hmm. So I have to also, you know, when I say you have to crucify that, I also mean I have to also crucify the privileges that I have. Right. And that's not easy. And that's, that's where I'm struggling because it's well, not easy to do. I, I think, well, yeah, I, I think part I, of the. I want, to give, I want to give room for somebody else to get a question in. Yeah. We've got another question. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Daryl. Other, other questions. Michael Chancellor, it's good to see you, man. Thanks for being on. Joyce Williams, good to see you. Uh, you, you I know you love the book. Uh, and Kevin, good to see you. Joyce, you, you're trying to unmute. Okay, unmute and there you go. Now you're unmuted. Okay, and I'm not sure that this is a question, but when I was reading the book and I got to the word that married Caucasian and audacity, I embraced the meaning of that word, caucasity. And your comments following it, talked about the white plus that's discharged from it, good description. And I thought about statements from people like um, James Cone and, and others who said that slaves had to realize that these people were not human, they're satanic emissaries. Mm -hmm. And so I, have to work with the fact that you said you didn't know whether it was learned behavior or inherited behavior. And people who know me say, I think it is in the DNA. It is in that, those supremacist beings. Mm -hmm. 
And so the disease, psychopathic disease that comes from it, that those on the underside suffer from. I don't think they have the humanity to even understand it. Satan doesn't understand that kind of thing. So I'm still, you know, messing around with that because I feel all of that inside after I'm a young woman, very, very young. And after working in social justice and all of that for 60 or more years, the light finally came on in my head and I determined that it is not only learned and inherited, that it's in the DNA. Now, so that's where I'm standing. I don't know what the question is, but that's a good word to describe. <laughs> no, and I would agree with you. I mean, the reason I, I left it ambiguous as far as I'm concerned at DNA or, or, or learned behavior is because I didn't want to go into that argument in the book. In other words, I'm saying at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter that much because we're still going to face the horrors of, of, of racism and ethnic discrimination. Um, and, I, and I don't want to spend too much time trying to figure out the, you know, the biology of it. I'm more interested okay. in okay. how do okay. we deal with, with, with what we're facing. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I kind of left it a little bit. But, but quite frankly, um, you know, it's interesting because there's some research now being done about how um, trauma is being passed on by DNA in the DNA to next to up down to two or three generations. Yeah. So there's definitely something there, you know. All right. Uh, want to give a book away, um, and I want I want to turn it kick it to to Anna to. Uh, to, to uh, do that, Anna or Garbo. Alrighty, so we're coming to the end of our program. I just cooked dinner while listening to this excellent history lesson. Thank you so much, Dr. Miguel de la Torre. Working on my R's too. <laughs> so um, at the end of every presentation, um, we like to give a book away. Um, so, really quickly. Um, I have made, give me one second, our classic Wheel of Names. Uh-oh. Um, and while I finish this, <clears throat> if you are interested in purchasing the book, um, you have three ways to do so. You can do that online at our website, pyramid1988.com. We also have a bookshop website. You can come by the store. We can bring it out to your car. We also ship. So um, one second. This is our famous wheel of names. And while I am, I have everybody up. I did remove some people who told me like you in your comments that you've had the book already. <laughs> um, so Joyce Williams, you already read the book. Mr. Comstock, you're not in here either. Um, would anybody else like to remove themselves? Like you already have a copy of the book? Anybody? Okay, well, we will do our spin the wheel of names and see who won a copy of Decolonizing Christianity. All right, Mr. Jim McGill, <laughs> if you have not read the book or purchased it, you are the lucky winner of a copy of Decolonizing Christianity. We will follow up by email. Um, Reverend Griffin, Dr. De La Torre, would you like to close us out? Dr. De La Torre, I want to give you a chance to make a closing statement. Then I'm going to give acknowledgments and kick it to Garbo to wrap up. I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for reading the book. It's um, you know, when you write a book, you never know if anybody's going to even read it or not. <laughs> you kind of like send it out to the universe and wonder whatever, you know, whatever happens to it. So 
I'm always honored when that people actually read it and discuss it and, and wrestle with it. So thank you for your time and, and for being here this evening. Thank you, Dr. Delatore, for taking the time to be with us. I know you've got a you know, you're a full professor, you've got doctoral students, you've got MDiv students, you got writing projects, you're researching, you're writing books, and so you got a full schedule. You worked us in. Thank you very much, brother, and uh, we're in your debt. I want to also thank Garbo Hearn and, Gar and Anna Hearn for partnering with New Millennium Church. I want to thank the folks at New Millennium Church for embracing this idea. We believe that folks don't need any more Bible studies. They just need to know how to live out the faith that they've been reading about. And we need to hear people who have been working on this and are working through this in the brightest mind. So thank you for Dr. Dr. Tori for being part of this process. Let me give you a heads up. I am in conversation with Dr. Alan Buzak about his latest book, Selfless Revolutionaries, Biko, Black Consciousness, Black Theology, and a Global Ethic of Solidarity and Resistance. It just came out. He dedicated it to, go, to Jeremiah Wright. It just came out last month. Uh, I'm getting with Dr. Buzak about having him up in November. So you may want to make the note, get Dr. Buzak's latest book. Of course, Pyramid is my stuff to get to. No, I tell people, Jeff Bezos doesn't need any more of your money. Get your books, order them from Pyramid, order them from a, order them from a, off color bookstore from a black bookstore. And so Pyramid is my bookstore. I am a shameless advocate. Yeah, I baptize the folks and I also believe in buying the books. So uh, bless you for that. Lastly, lastly, Garbo Hearn, thank you for working with us. Thanks for the blessing. Dr. Delatora, thank you for the time. All right, Sister Garbo, okay. take us out. Again, I'd like to thank all of you for your presence tonight and Dr. Delatore for your transparency. And we can wish you continue your thoughts and we will follow you and we want to we want to discuss your next book. So and for a new millennium for partnering with Pyramid Art Books and Custom Framing to continue these substantive conversations. So we look forward to the next in November and we'll keep you posted on the date. So good night, everyone, and thank you for being here. And thank you, Anna. Good night. Good night.